The basic laws of health. Incorporate those eight laws. They sound simple. They sound simple. You may have heard it your whole life, but I tell you, those eight laws will make the difference of whether you live long or you live short. The things that you can grow in your garden, that you can put in your kitchen, that's where your medicine cabinet should be. In 1969, in my home state of Tennessee, we were the fourth healthiest state in the nation. In 2009, we were the fourth unhealthiest state in the nation. And when Nashville wanted to see why, they found there was two major reasons. Number one, our diet. In 1969, when we went out to eat, we went to grandmother's house to go out to eat. 2009, folks were going to McDonald's, uh, they're going to Burger King, they were going out to whatever kind of restaurant it was, but they weren't eating at home. The other thing they found is in 1969, folks were drinking water. Or if they did drink a soft drink, they were drinking just a little soft drink. But in 2009, folks were drinking 48 ounce gulps, two liters, a lot of soft drinks. And those two things made a huge difference in how healthy Tennesseans were just over those few years from 1969 to 2009. Well, I'd like to look today at what impact a kitchen can have on your health. What's in the refrigerator, what's in the kitchen cabinets can either make you healthy or it can make you sick. And we found that there's some basic rules of law. What we eat, what we drink, are we exercising? Are we getting sunshine? Are we getting fresh air? Are we temperate? Are we making the right decisions? What time do you go to bed? And do you trust God? Those laws are the foundation that we're looking at here, but we'd like to look just at nutrition today in the kitchen and see what kitchen medicine or the kitchen medicine cabinet can do for your health. As we look at what's in the house, do you have good rich food like this kale that's packed full of nutrients? It's got, you know, it's, kale's probably the most nutritious of the vegetables. Are you juicing it? Are you eating it? And then what about other foods like garlic? Garlic's one of my favorite. Garlic builds your immune system. It raises your HDL. Very, very important for our health. And as we look, are you eating beans and are you eating apples and oranges and lemons and healthy food? Well, let's see what that healthy food and what herbs can do for us today. The first thing I'd like to look at is some things called essential oils, and essential oils come from, uh, from herbs. Well, they're a little more powerful than just herbs that are like this right here, and they can, um, they can last a long time, but they're just super, super powerful. I'm, we're going to look at peppermint today. We're going to look at frankincense. Frankincense is huge. It's a good wound healer. It's great for addressing cancer. We're going to look at lemongrass. Lemongrass is antiviral. Now, it's many other things these herbs do, but I'm just mentioning some big things. Oil of oregano. Oil of oregano is one of my favorite. It's, I have it at work. I've got it at the, uh, all, at, uh, in my car. I've got it at the house beside the bed. If you start to feel bad, you know how you feel up here in your nose or in your throat or you feel like someone's sitting on you, you're starting to get sick, what you do is you just take just five drops, and I put it in my mouth, hold it there for about two minutes and then swallow it, or you can put it in a glass of water and drink it. And then about two hours later, if you're still not feeling too well, but probably you won't be if you catch it in the incipient stage, right when it's first starting, Two hours later, if it's still there, do it again. That's probably the last time you're going to do it if you caught it in that first stage. It's amazing how well oil of oregano can kill viruses and bacteria. And then let's look at a few more. Let's look at cayenne. Cayenne pepper is super. You can use it for wounds. Let's say you get cut. I remember one time I was on the phone with my dad and uh, we were talking. He was living down in Florida at the time and I hear my mom holler back in the kitchen. I said, what's wrong? He said, she just cut herself. I said, well, tell her to put some cayenne pepper on it if it won't stop bleeding. He says, it's not stopping bleeding. So he told her to put some cayenne pepper on it. It stopped. 
Then when she went to her doctor a few days later, who was an older fellow who was about to retire, she thought he'd get a laugh out of it. He said, you know what, I forgot about that. When I was in medical school, they taught us to put cayenne pepper on wounds that would not stop bleeding. Amazing. Or what if a person's having some angina? Well, you just put some cayenne pepper in the water. It's tremendous. And I, I have people who use it, and they tell me it works better than nitroglycerin, and they're not getting the headaches. But cayenne peppers, very, very important. Increases the circulation. Great. Milk thistle, excellent for the liver. I had a lady come in one time, and she, her doctor told her, that's it, you're going to die. She had cirrhosis of the liver. She was an alcoholic. And I encouraged her, one, stop drinking. She said, I've already done that. I'm not drinking another drop. And I told her, I said, well, take the milk thistle and take two dropperfuls three times a day. She was yellow. I mean, she was a white lady, and she was yellow. Her, her skin was let yellow all over. Her eyes were yellow. So we did this, and then we did bentonite clay all over her several times a day. Well, she's still alive. She no longer has cirrhosis of the liver. God healed her. It's amazing what milk thistle can do for our liver. And then we have lobelia, one of my favorites. It's excellent for lung issues. It's an antispasmodic, but it's also a spasmodic. Remember Serp of Ipecac when we were kids? And if someone got in, let's say one of the kids ate some aspirins and, and mom and dad caught it and they'd have them drink some Serp of Ipecac, and they'd throw up and get rid of it. Well, Labilia do the same thing. If I opened this bottle, drank the whole thing, I wouldn't make it out that door without throwing up. But that's not what I use it for mostly. I use it actually as an antispasmodic. It's tremendous if a person has, let's say, um, uh, epileptic seizures. Just 30 drops up to three times a day is a tremendous antispasmodic. Uh, we also used it for, um, let's say if a person's doing a, uh, a gallbladder liver cleanse. If they have gallstones, what it will do is it will, it will dilate that bile duct and allow those gallstones to go through and it won't get caught in that bile duct. It's also excellent for the lungs. Tremendous, tremendous. And then Hawthorne. Hawthorne is very good for the heart. I've seen ejection fraction. Now I had a fella come in. He was in his mid-60s. He had an ejection fraction. That's how well the heart perfuses, how well it squeezes. Have you ever milked a cow? And as you're milking that cow, and then you see old kitty over here, and you squeeze it a little harder to get it over to the cat, well, that perfusion, that squeezing of the heart, if it's not very strong, we call that ejection fraction. And his was 15. Terrible. The man didn't have a lot of money, and he says, just give me one thing. He started Hawthornberry. That's all he did. Well, God did the healing. But the man went from ejection fraction from 15 to 55 by using Hawthornberry. Tremendous, tremendous for the heart. Pine needle. If you don't have pine sap, which is a, one of my favorites, if you don't have pine sap to use in wound formulas or put on wounds, uh, pine needle oil also works very well if you don't have that. Lavender. I was talking with my daughter-in-law, Summer, just the other day, and she told me that my grandson, Kyler, was having problems sleeping, and what she does is she has one of these little uh, diffusers in the room where he sleeps, and she puts lavender in there every night. Well, he was having problems going to sleep and settling down. Now that she puts the lavender in that diffuser, he's falling asleep. She'll put it in before she takes him to the room to put him to bed. And when he gets in there, he smells the lavender, it calms you down. Ladies love lavender, it calms them down. They'll use it in the bathtub, and, but lavender is very, very good. Another one's clove, clove oil. And many of y'all have heard of clove oil, your dentist has. If you have a toothache and that tooth, you just can't get that tooth to, to quit hurting and you can't get into a dentist for two weeks or whatever, pull out from your medicine cabinet. Don't wait till you have a toothache to go try to find it because they may not have it anywhere near you. Find it, put it in your kitchen medicine cabinet. And if you have a toothache that's just, y'all have had toothaches, you know how bad they hurt. Put a little clove oil on there. Be careful, don't get it on your tongue. It'll numb your tongue too. But put a little clove oil on that gum area there, inside, outside, and we'll talk about some other things to do. But clove oil will kill the pain. 
for that toothache. Also, I use clove oil when I'm out working in my garden. Let's say there's gnats and, and mosquitoes. I'll take a little clove oil, put it on me. I'll use uh, eucalyptus. I'll use different ones, but this is one I'll use. The gnats can't stand it for about two hours, and then I'll put some more on. Works very, very well. Citronella, another great one to keep the bugs off. You know of citronella candles. Well, this is citronella oil, and I use it to keep bugs off and, and varmints away. Now, another one, let's go back to the peppermint, if you want to keep bugs away. Mice. If you ever get mice wanting to come in the house, or rats in the barn, or maybe squirrels in the attic, they hate peppermint. And so what you do is you put peppermint on a, uh, a cotton ball, toss it in a drawer, toss it under the, uh, in, a, a kit, in a kitchen drawer or, or, or wherever, uh, pour it across, uh, spray it over a, a, a threshold where, the, you know, where the, they might come in the house, um, throw it in the attic to keep the uh, squirrels away. It works very well to keep rodents away. We also use it for spiders. Spiders don't like it either. Ants don't like it too much but especially spiders and uh, rodents like squirrels, mouses, and rats. Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is really good. Have you ever heard of albuterol? Albuterol is something that we use if, uh, if a person's having problems breathing. I used to use it. I used to have asthma years ago, and I changed my lifestyle, and my doctor, I went to a different doctor, that did natural medicine, and he said, quit doing dairy. And I did, because I had some colon issues that they told me I was going to die from. And I was telling this doctor some other issues. I said, I have full-blown asthma. And he said, I think we can get rid of your asthma if you'll get rid of that dairy. Well, I said, you don't understand. I have full-blown asthma. I'll have it the rest of my life, according to my pulmonologist. He said, let's just try it. Well, I quit the dairy. Asthma went away. So if you have, if you're using albuterol, you can put in, in your nebulizer, you can take maybe put um, in some uh, distilled water, and depending on the strength of the oil, like this oil is not as strong as this brand. This brand's a lot stronger than this one is, but depending on uh, two drops to eight drops, depending on how strong it is, you can put that in that water, put it back in that little bowl, and breathe on it, and it will, get, it will work as a bronchial dilator, just like the albuterol, mullein, uh, uh, sage. All three of those are excellent bronchial dilators. If you remember, when we were kids, we used Vicks. My grandmother didn't go anywhere. I don't care what time of the year, 365 days without her Vicks. Well, Vicks has eucalyptus in it, and I can remember as a boy, I'd have to put it in my nose if i get a little stuffy. Well, Vicks has petroleum. And so you can make your own Vicks by using some unpetroleum jelly and just putting some uh, eucalyptus in there. Or you can just put it on a, um, I had a friend. He was a physical therapist. And he, you know those little inhalers? Well, you can use that. And if it runs out, you just take a syringe, soak up some of that, um, uh, uh, pull up some of that eucalyptus, put it in that inhaler, and you made a brand new inhaler. Or you can just put it on, I, many times I put it on a, a, a Kleenex and just smelled on it when, my, when I'm a little stuffy. I don't do that anymore because I'm using the oil of oregano. Another one is olive leaf. Olive leaf is an excellent antiviral. If you have a virus like Ebola, uh, I do a radio program and I had a, a physician uh, was speaking on there just two weeks ago and he was talking about diseases infectious diseases, and he was talking about how do you address Ebola. This was the first thing he recommended, was olive leaf extract. We've used it for years. I learned from a good friend of mine, Dr. Agatha Thrash, to use it for shingles, to use it for, uh, if you're going uh, for like um, mosquito bites, uh, malaria, excellent for malaria. You use, uh, let's say if you're taking capsules, 800 milligrams twice a day, 30 days prior to going on your mission trip, and while you're on your mission trip, it's excellent for keeping you from getting malaria. So olive leaf extract is very, very good for us. And the last essential oil here is sage. And we use sage for Parkinson's. Um, 60 drops a day, 30 drops in the morning, 30 drops at night, and we're finding benefits with, uh, with sage. 
Now also, we're finding benefits with Parkinson's if a person's riding a bicycle, something's going on between the brain and right, that coordination riding that bicycle. So that's another good thing to use. And the, a couple more here I want to get before I get into this is vitamin D. Now, we're up in Canada right now, and especially in the wintertime, folks don't get a lot of sunshine, especially right here. It, it rains a lot here. Vitamin D is very, very important for us. It's important for your immune system. It's important for building of your HDL, your, your good cholesterol. We found out why boys are more prone to get autism than girls. Just found out this year, a study came out of Harvard University, and it found that when little boys are, are deficient in vitamin D, and little girls, they, don't ha they won't make as much serotonin, therefore making them more prone to autism. But the little girl has more estrogen. And because she has more estrogen, then she's able to produce enough serotonin where she's not as prone to get autism as the little boys. Now we know there's other issues, immunizations and other issues out there that we have concerns about. But why boys, girls? Vitamin D. And so if you're not getting enough sunshine, and a lot of people aren't today, you need to take a vitamin D um, uh, supplement. You will need D3, like this one here comes from uh, uh, sea vegetables from down in the ocean. But that, that vitamin D is very important. You, that ranges from 30 to 100. You want to be 100 for your immune system. The last one I want to touch base on is trace minerals. And these things you want in your kitchen medicine cabinet. A lot of folks don't get enough trace minerals, and here's why. What happens is you've got fats, proteins, and complex carbohydrates. They say carbohydrates, I like complex, not refined carbs. So you've got fats, proteins, and complex carbohydrates. To make those guys work, you've got to have vitamins. And in order for the vitamins to work, you've got to have minerals. Well, what's the problem with minerals? Most folks aren't eating out of their kitchens, eating foods like this kale here, which is super, super good and, and loaded with minerals. So two things are happening. You got food that's, or three things actually, you have foods that are processed, you have erosion, and then folks are using hybrid seeds instead of open pollinated seeds or the old heirloom seeds. University of North Carolina found if we will grow, let's say this is a large garden, and we planted, say, tomatoes on this side that are from hybrid seeds, and this side, which is from the open pollinated seeds, according to the University of North Carolina, Department of Agriculture, the hybrid seeds only pick up a, right at 40% of the nutrients that your open pollinated, your heirloom seeds, uh, picked up. So what's happening? You're only getting 40 cents on the dollar on that nutrition. And look at all the time that you went and you, you prepared the soil, you planted your seeds, you, you cultivated, you watered, you picked it, you put it up, just based on the seed that you stuck in the ground can make the difference of how much nutrients you're getting in that food. So trace minerals really, really help. Um, to be able to, again, you've got your fats, proteins, complex carbohydrates, you've got your vitamins, your minerals. The vitamins and minerals are catalyst. So if the, if the, um, if the, minerals are on eight cylinders, it makes the vitamins at eight cylinders. When the vitamins are on eight cylinders, then it makes the fats, proteins, and carbohydrates work at eight cylinders. I say complex carbohydrates. Okay, when I work with people who want to stop smoking, I use something called Smoker's Blend. And I don't just use it for stopping smoking. I'm now using it for even folks that want to quit drinking alcohol. I even have folks that come to me on heroin, uh, meth, big drugs and they're using this blend also. So what's in it? So the first thing we do is we use three-fourths of a cup of lemon juice and then we use a fourth of a cup of honey. I'm going to double check this to make sure this is three-fourths of a cup. That 
that looked a little shy. Let's add a little bit more. And you want to use fresh lemon juice. So it's three-fourths a cup of lemon juice, a fourth of a cup of honey, and then one-third of a teaspoon of peppermint essential oil. One-third of a teaspoon of peppermint essential oil. And that's it. And what they do is any time they get a hankering or a desire for a smoke or a drink of moonshine or whatever they're drinking or a drug, they'll take a nip. And what I like doing, let's try it first. That's, that's tasty. And what, I, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll put it in like a little jar. You could put it in like a pint mason jar, but if it's perfect in this little guy, and they can just carry it around with them. You don't have to keep it in the refrigerator. They can put it in overnight. But what you'll do is you just have them, uh, just take a nip on it, take a swallow. Anytime they get a desire, as we call it in Tennessee, a hankering. The next item is rocket fuel, and probably a lot of you have heard of rocket fuel before. What we use, we'll take a little bit of water, we'll add a little more in a few minutes. I like warm water, but I'm going to use anywhere between five and 10 cloves of garlic. Start with five, and then build up to 10. A half an onion. These Vitamixes are so powerful. One time I was demonstrating some, and what I'd do, I'd take some uh, corn cobs after folks ate cor corn on the cob, and I'd fill it full of corn cobs, and I'd pour some water in there, and I'd turn it on. And time after time, I'd teach a class on this, and these ladies would go, honey, you're gonna tear that thing up. Well, it works fine, it's very strong. So we're gonna put five cloves of garlic, a half, of an onion. We're going to put, let's see here, get a tablespoon. Two tablespoons of honey. All of these are excellent for getting rid of, for building the immune system, for getting rid of whatever's ailing you. We're going to take just a, some cayenne pepper, and, and depending on how strong you like cayenne pepper, anywhere from an eighth of a teaspoon to a half of a teaspoon. An eighth of a teaspoon to a half of a teaspoon. And then you're going to put some ginger in there, about the size of your thumb. We call it a thumb of ginger. Now something that I've added, I've started adding to mine, and I don't have it with me today, and that is elderberry syrup. I put about a teaspoon of elderberry syrup. Elderberries are phenomenal. If a person's starting to get sick, if you're worried about a pandemic event, Actually, the best herbalist around the world will tell you they're going to use elderberries to fight that virus. And so I put in elderberry syrup. It also makes it taste a little bit better. So we got five cloves of garlic, 
um, a, a half of an onion. Oh, I didn't put the lemon. We're going to put the juice of two lemons. We've got a half an onion. We've got a thumb of ginger. We've got a, two tablespoons of raw honey. When you're attacking the immune system, you want to use local honey. You want it raw honey, and you want it that it hasn't been processed or non-processed honey. And then we got the, the elderberry. We're going to blend it just a little bit. We're going to add just a little bit more water to net a quart. And again, I like warm water. And then I like taking it and putting it in a mason jar. And you want to drink it within 30 minutes. Another item that I use a lot, and that's a charcoal poultice. And most of you have probably heard of charcoal poultices, but I learned from a therapist that I hired from Switzerland a different way to make a charcoal poultice. So what I'm going to use is activated charcoal. And I'm not going to make a huge one, but I'll, you'll get the idea here. I'm going to take two tablespoons of charcoal. I usually make a large one that I make about this large. And uh, that way a person can cut it and use it different times. But to, for the sake of time, we're going to make a smaller one. But you'll get the idea. And then I'm going to take and use psyllium seed husk powder. Psyllium powder. Let's see here. Here it is. And again, I'm going to use equal parts. Psyllium is the binder. Charcoal is the drawer. It adsorbs. It doesn't absorb. It adsorbs. It's kind of like if I have a sponge here and there's water on here and I soak up the water, that's absorbing. But the charcoal adsorbs. So let's say I have some flour here and I have a dry sponge and I'm go across and it sticks to the outside, that's adsorbing. And so the charcoal does the adsorbing, but the psyllium does two things. It binds it and holds it together, but charcoal has to be wet to work. So you want to thoroughly mix it together. Now you can do one of two things. You can pre-mix it, and I call it instant poultice, and put it in a jar, take it on a hike with you, uh, you get stung by a bee or bit by a snake or whatever it might be, you, all you have to do is add the water. So what I'm going to do now is I've got one part uh, charcoal, I've got one part um, slip, uh, psyllium seed husk powder, psyllium seed husk powder, and then you're going to add um, six parts water. Now, how many did I put? I did two tablespoons. So we're going to do six parts times two, 12 tablespoons of water. Now you don't want to wait too long before you start stirring it, or that psyllium is actually going to start congealing. Now notice there's a lot of water there. And you think, well, you've made a mistake here. There's just too much water. Well, watch what happens. Look what's going on here, y'all. I'm going to mix it. So first, we mixed it thoroughly before we added the water. Very important. Don't forget to mix it thoroughly before you add the water because the psyllium will soak up the water, and unless the charcoal is mixed in with it well, then it's not going to, just the psyllium is going to congeal and you'll have dry charcoal out there. 
see what it looks like. Amazing. Now what I do, another thing I, le I learned from this fella is he would take some saran wrap or plastic wrap. You can take a, a grocery bag and do it between the grocery bag. This is the hardest thing I'm going to do today is tear this and it not stick. So you take it, you can take a piece of tape and tape it to hold it down a little bit better. It works a little bit better. I'm going to put this in here. You can use, use a rolling pin. You may use a, uh, a mason jar, whatever you want. Wait a few minutes and let it soak up a little bit better. See how much better it holds together with that psyllium? Now, you can go ahead and let's say you have an eye infection. Just cut a piece out that's about the size, a little bit bigger than your eye. Or let's say a person has a boil. We call it a boil. And it, let's say they have a, a boil on their arm, you want it a little bit bigger, place it on there. Now if, if there's an open wound, put a piece of wet paper towel there because charcoal does have a propensity to uh, tattoo. And so you don't want it to tattoo, especially something on the face. But put that on there and then put your charcoal poultice on there. Put some, silly, uh, uh, some um, saran wrap or plastic wrap on top of that so that it won't dry out. And then you can either tape that or use some gauze or something to hold that on. And then change it. We use it for breast cancer. I went to Michigan and up to Battle Creek a number of years ago and learned how to use it on breast cancer and lung cancer. Uh, we use charcoal poultices on a lot, whether it may be some edema or some terrible wounds. And we'll look at those later. Now, what you do is you can take it and roll it like this, stick it in the refrigerator. And if you want it to last a long time, you can put it in a Ziploc baggie, put it in the freezer, it'll last years. In the refrigerator, it'll last about five to seven days. If you've ever gone fishing in the ocean, squid feels just like squid. The next one's a mustard plaster. And mustard plasters were used a lot back years ago, especially in 1918. Do you remember what happened in 1918? The influenza. And there was two major treatments that they used that were very, very effective on addressing the influenza. One was a mustard plaster, and the other one was a revulsive treatment, a hydrotherapy treatment of hot and cold on the chest with fomentations. But the mustard plaster is what we're looking at today. So what we're going to do is we're going to use, uh, let's see here, we're going to, well, I use three parts um, uh, flour. Now I like using whole wheat flour instead of white flour because the white flour is stickier and it's just harder to manage. So I'm going to use three parts wheat flour. And then one part mustard. The thing with mustard is you don't know how hot mustard is, the heating units of mustard, like cayenne. On cayenne, this cayenne right here is about 180,000 HUs. Cayenne can go up to 2.1 million HUs. What you buy in the store might just be 20,000 HUs, HUs, heating units. They measure cayenne, but they don't measure mustard. So you want, you'll have to kind of test it. Uh, that bag of mustard or jar of mustard you bought and figure out you need to add a little more, a little less to get that heat that you want. So what you're going to do is you're going to mix it well, kind of like the charcoal and the psyllium powder. You want to mix it thoroughly because that wheat is the binder. You could probably use psyllium with it too. Because that's all it's doing is just binding it. Now we're going to add water. And you want it about as thick 
as is if you're making biscuit dough. So we'll just have to play with it. And you want to make it large enough for the affected area. So let's say a person has um, pneumonia. Well, this is what I'm going to put on them. Needs a little bit more water. And you want it enough, I would probably put it on both lungs. And you can put it on the front and the back. You don't just have to put it on the front. That's a good consistency there. About like biscuit dough. Went well mixed. Now the difference in a mustard plaster and a charcoal poultice, a charcoal poultice you're pulling out the toxins and pulling, and, and it's, it's actually, the, must, the charcoal poultice is soaking up stuff. The mustard plaster, what it's doing, it's increasing vascular flow. It's increasing more blood flow to that area, so it's not getting contaminated. So you can actually use your mustard plaster five, six times. Again, I use the, um, either the Walmart bag or the, the, the T-shirt bag, we call it, plastic bag. Now, when I was in Venezuela, they don't have the luxury, many places out in the bush, of plastic. And so when they're making charcoal poultices or mustard plasters, they're using a sheet. And they'll use that sheet over and over and over. And so that will work. We used to use a paper towel. When I first started making charcoal poultices, I would just use a paper towel and, it, and make it wet on the outside, and it will soak right through it. So um, it, you can, depending on where you are around the world, uh, you might be listening in Africa right now, or you might be listening in Malaysia. So depending on where you are is what you'll, you'll, you'll use in hand. Now, obviously this won't work for an adult lung. It might work fine for one side of a, 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 an infant. Now the charcoal poultice, we made it a quarter of an inch thick, one-fourth of an inch thick. On the mustard plaster, we're making it an eighth of an inch thick. Now the difference in the charcoal poultice and the mustard plaster Unless you made just a small charcoal poultice, you're taking a part of that charcoal poultice and you're putting it on the hand and you're getting a piece of cellophane and putting it on it. But on the, on the mustard plaster, you're making one the size for one thing. And so let's say that you have inflammation in the hand or let's say that you were putting it on the lung. That you would put it directly on, you won't put any barrier, put it on and you'll leave the plastic. You don't want to throw away this piece of plastic because when you pull it off, you're going to put that plastic back on there. Roll it up, and it's ready to use another time. You don't want to use a mustard plaster on children less than two years of age. Because mustard plasters can burn. They actually can, if they, you leave them on too long, they can actually blister the skin. So we don't use it on children less than two years of age because they can't say, that's getting hot. I'm starting to feel hot. They're just trusting you. Or they might start crying. So you want them old enough to say, that's starting to burn. If so, take it off. Normally, people will use, leave it on anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. But if they say it's getting too hot prior to that 10 minutes, take it off. Don't say, well, we got to leave it on there for 10 minutes. I'm sorry. You might blister that child or blister that adult. So just take it off and then you'll use it again. So that's the mustard plaster, it works very, very well. Our next one's the castor oil pack. I like using castor oil packs. I use them for breast cancer. I use them for ovarian cysts. I use them for lumps in the breast. You can use them for all kinds of things. Well, what you do is, we've got our water. I'll turn this down a little bit here. We've got some warm castor oil here. 
So actually, we'll just use this here. We heated up some castor oil. And so what we'll do is we'll take, I like flannel. This isn't a piece of flannel, but I like flannel because it wicks the best. And you just take that flannel and you stick it down in that castor oil. It's rather messy and sticky. Kind of squeeze it out. And then you'll place it on top of, after you squeezed it out, that area that you're wanting to address, whether it's, it could be breast cancer, it could be a, like I said, an ovarian cyst or a cyst in the breast, but I use it a lot, probably use it the most on shingles. Now, remember we talked about shingles a few minutes ago? The olive leaf extract is the best thing. It's antiviral, and shingles is a virus. Well, the olive leaf extract is going to work on the virus, but this guy right here is going to dry up those shingles. And so I do two things for shingles. I use the oil of oregano. I use the castor oil pack. And because stress exacerbates or makes worse the, the, uh, the shingles, I also recommend B-Complex. B-Complex is phenomenal, phenomenal on stress. B-Complex 100, that's 100 milligrams or micrograms, depending on which B that you're looking at there. And give one of those each meal. And what you do is just lay this on top of the affected area and then you'll put a piece of cellophane or something on top of it and, and, uh, and uh, tape it down. And then change it may every, say, twice a day or three times a day. A wound salve. I make a lot of wound salves. I like working with wounds. See if this sounds familiar. I'll take one part golden seal. One part myrrh gum powder. Sound familiar? And one part frankincense. Now frankincense is super duper for wounds, especially deep wounds. Now it's interesting. You've got frankincense here and a powder, which is rather economical. And then you have frankincense and essential oil which is very expensive. It takes a lot of frankincense like this to make essential oil, and that's why it's so expensive. Um, but if I'm making like just a wound salve, this, this works very, very well. If I'm addressing cancer, I'm going to use the essential oil because it's much, much more powerful. Now I'm going to mix these together. One part golden seal, which kills any type of uh, infection or pathogen that might be there. And then I have one part myrrh powder, myrrh gum powder, which is really, really good. It's antiviral. It also is good for healing the tissue. And then frankincense, one part, which is really good also for healing tissue. Now, then I'm going to use pine sap. Now, remember I told, mentioned earlier about pine oil. Pine, pine needle oil will do similar, not as strong, but pine oil is also very good if you don't have the pine sap. So how do you get pine sap? Well, just, this time of year is a little more difficult in the wintertime, but if your sap's up, just go out and bark a tree and get your own sap. If it's too thick, you can cut it a little bit with some turpentine or a little olive oil, and that'll make it th a little thinner. You want it about the viscosity of motor oil, and we'll talk about pine sap a little later in another, another series. But I take about 50% of what I put in, so a half a part of pine sap. And then I'm going to add aloe vera gel or juice. Now, you can either go to the store and buy the aloe vera juice or the aloe vera gel, or like today I didn't have any, so I made my own. You just take your, your aloe vera leaves, strip off the outer bar, uh, leaf of it, 
I like you to fillet a fish, cut that outer part out, and then chop it up, and I add a little bit of water, and I'll blend it up. And I have my own aloe vera uh, gel, which is actually better than what you buy in the store. So I'm going to add a little bit, and I'm going to work on it, because I want to get the right consistency. It's about 1.5 parts of the aloe vera gel, but you just have to play with it and see. And you want to make the wound salve a little juicier at first because it's going to, the powders are going to continue to soak up the, the aloe vera and so it can dry up on you a little bit. If it does, just add a little more aloe vera. If you don't have, by that time you don't have any aloe vera, you can just add a little water. This is actually perfect right here for putting on right now. If I was going to, uh, uh, you can kind of see the consistency there, but if I was going to make it for someone else uh, that I wasn't going to immediately use it, I'd add just a little more aloe vera so that as it continues to soak up, it's not going to dry out on them. This wound salve is tremendous. We've had really good success. And you just put it directly on the wound after you do hydrotherapy. You do some hot and cold. It depends on the type of wound. If, you, if, if you, they've got neuropathy or, or it's really, really bad, I'm not going to use really hot water in my contrast of hot and cold uh, foot, uh, foot bath. I'll use, say, 100 degrees warm, 70 degrees cool. So I'm going to do, or an arm bath or whatever. So three minutes warm, one minute cool. Three minutes warm, one minute cool, seven times. And then you're going to add this, put it straight on there. If it's infected, put you, some char uh, put you uh, a little piece of wet paper towel, put that charcoal poultice on there, and you're ready to go. Do that twice a day. Wound salve works extremely, extremely well. One more thing, a couple more things on the wound salve. If the person smokes, I've never found it to work because when the person smokes, you have vasal constriction and you don't have adequate perfusion down to that extremity, especially on extremities. You're just not going to get down there and, and address that. And so they've got to quit smoking. Might be a good reason for them to quit smoking. The other thing is, is they've got to have good nutrition. For that tissue to heal properly, they've got to have good nutrition. So I encourage you, encourage you to juice them. Have them ju juice vegetable juice because there's just super amounts of nutrients in vegetable juice. It's going to be in the blood within 15 minutes. It's not going to take a lot of time to a vital force to digest it. And if you can juice them at least a quart a day of vegetable juice, they're going to get more nutrition down to that wound. And again, if they're smoking, they don't have adequate oxygenation because of what's happening physiologically with the tobacco and all those thousands of toxins that are in the tobacco. Hydrogen peroxide. I was not able to bring food grade 35% hydrogen peroxide with me today on an airplane. And so I'll tell you about it. I found hydrogen peroxide to be a big tool for me. It's not the same as what you buy in the grocery store. What you get in the grocery store or the pharmacy is 1.5% uh, or 3%. And you don't want to use it because it has a, a, preservative in it, a preservative in it that is toxic. It's poisonous. And so you can't drink that. But the food grade hydrogen peroxide you can consume uh, orally. And what you'll do is, uh, we, well, what we use it for is we'll use it for people who have candida or yeast. Works very well for that. We also use it for cancer. It's, it's quite uh, impressive on what it does for addressing cancer. If the person has yeast, what they'll do is you'll take five ounces of distilled water three times a day on an empty stomach. The first day, you'll put one drop of the 35% food grade hydrogen peroxide. One drop, one drop, one drop in those five ounces of, of distilled water on an empty stomach each day. Well, for the first day. The second day, you add to go to two drops. So each day, you increase by one drop. It's very important when you, a person has candida or yeast that you start with one drop because we've got to start slow on this thing because it's going to get pretty mad pretty soon. So you'll do the, uh, the one drop three times a day, two drops, and you keep working up. Your goal is 25 drops three times a day of the hydrogen peroxide, 35% food grade, in that five ounces of distilled water. Somewhere between day 10 and day 20, you're going to get sick if you have yeast.
probably around day 15, day 16 to where I mostly see it. You're going to have flu-like symptoms for three to four days. A lady came to me one day and she says, I can't do this anymore. I said, why? She says, I'm sick. I said, what day is it? She says, it's day 16. And she says, I'm so sick today, I just can't do it. I said, remember I told you that's going to happen? That means it's working. She said, that's right. You did tell me that. I'll do it. So she did it. And then for about three, four days, I don't remember on her situation how long she was sick. And so what you do is, let's say it's day 16, you'll, you'll go back to the previous day. So you get up this morning, you do your 16 drops, you do okay. Noon, you do this, or halfway in between, you do the 16 drops, and you're starting to feel really nauseous and sick. And it, you may get a little nauseous doing this anyway, but you may start having flu-like symptoms, and you just feel like someone beat you with a baseball bat. You know how it feels like when you get a flu? And you, you just want to sleep. Go back to 15 drops the day before that. So if you're day 16, go to 15. If you're day at 12, go back to 11. Then for the next several days, you go at a day less than what you got sick at. And stay at that lesser amount until you're not sick. You'll get better. And then you'll then start back up. I've only had folks get sick once. And at first, they're not happy. They're sick. But when it gets rid of the yeast, remember the problems? Just think about all the problems you have with yeast. Well, if you can get rid of it, it's worth it. And so go up to the 25 drops, stay at the 25 drops three times a day for three, uh, correction, for two weeks, two weeks. If symptoms are better, start back down. If not, stay there for up to a month and then come back down one drop a day and then stay at three drops three times a day as a maintenance works very well. For cancer, if you can handle it, you want 50 drops three times a day. That's tough. It's tough on the stomach. You can feel a little nauseous. You may have to put a little stump in the stomach while you're doing that. But I've seen brain cancer, I've seen prostate cancer obliterated. Now, who did the healing? God did the healing. But God uses the kitchen medicine cabinet. And, and you know, it's kind of like, let's say you said you don't want to eat anymore. God just take care of me and I'm not going to eat anymore. Well, he's not going to bless that because he gives us responsibility to eat. Well, he also gives us a responsibility to take care of ourselves when, our, when we're sick. Ask him to bless it, just like you ask him to bless that breakfast that you ate this morning or that dinner you ate this noon or that supper you, you're about to eat, that God will bless it and give you good health. So when you use any of these, you want to make sure you pray first and ask God to bless it. But the hydrogen peroxide treatment is very, very effective. Garlic oil. A lot of folks say they like gar garlic oil. Can you make your own garlic oil? Well, here's how you do it. I'm going to use a mason jar here. You're going to use, um, yes, let's use a mason jar. I'm going to use one cup of garlic, and I'm going to chop them up real quick. So now we've got a one cup of chopped up garlic, and now we're going to add one cup of, uh, correction, two cups of olive oil. Then you're just going to put the top on it, and uh, you're going to let it sit for seven days. You'll shake it every day, and then after seven days, you will, uh, you know, you're going to shake it, and I'd do it twice a day, and you just, sh you know, shake it good, and what I'll do, I'll show you how to do it. That's why I like these mason jars, is you just shake it in the morning, turn it upside down. And then tonight, you're going to shake it a little bit and turn it like that. And you're going to do it for seven days, and then you're going to strain it. And then you'll store it in the, in the refrigerator, and you have olive oil. Very, very good. Now, you want me to share with you my favorite garlic? Now, there's no question 
garlic like this is tremendous to use every day in your food. But when I re left regular health care, I asked God, show me what I can use to replace vancomycin, which is a very, very strong drug that we used intravenously for patients with, with um, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And we're seeing more and more of that today. And God showed something to me. It's called Allison. And Allison is super, super strong, super strong. It takes, it takes 24 cloves. So let's see here, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cloves in this one. So it takes three times this right here to make one drop of this. Now what you'll do is, is if we're addressing like a sinus infection, uh, the nurses will, well, the nurses at the hospital nearest, they were getting sinus infections and they take Cipro. Then they get a UTI, urinary tract infection, and then they would take another antibiotic and they'd get a yeast infection and wipe out the floor in their colon with this next antibiotic or both antibiotics. So then they started coming to me and they get this. They'll do 20 drops three times a day for nine days and it wipes out the sinus infections. And they don't get the UTIs, they don't get the yeast infections, and they don't wipe out the flora. Now, 20 drops three times a day of Allison is uh, 1,440 cloves of garlic a day. That's a lot. But if we're addressing something like MRSA, and I've been working with MRSA now uh, with, with this product for a little over 10 years. I s send it to doctors all over the United States who will buy 10, 12 bottles of this at a time to sell to their patients for MRSA. One teaspoon of MRSA, twi uh, t one teaspoon of, of the uh, Allison twice a day for three months wipes out MRSA. And what happens is, is MRSA likes to hide. And so when we contiguously are using that every day for three months, it, it just kills it. Well, when you do a teaspoon, there's 2,880 cloves. So we said three of these would equal 24. So you can imagine how many cloves it'd take to make 2,880 cl cloves, these things, how many bulbs it'd take to make that much to do a teaspoon. And we do that twice a day. Now, if I'm catching something, like I said, I'll use oil of oregano and, and I keep it again. I keep it in the office, I keep it in my car, and I keep it at home, actually on the, on the headboard in case I wake up at night and I feel like I'm catching something immediately in the incipient stage, I want to use this. But I'm also a firefighter uh, to help my local community out. And if I'm out at the middle of the night and I'm fighting a house fire and it's three degrees outside and I'm soaking wet and I'm, and I'm frozen and, and, I, and I'm not getting my sleep, I can start feeling it come on. And if I don't have my oil of oregano with me, which I usually don't out on the fire ground, and I wait about oh, six, eight hours before I can take the uh, the oil of oregano, the oil of oregano doesn't work well for me. So what I'll do, again, I don't have patience for being sick. As Soon as I get in, I take a tablespoon of Allison, and then I'll take a teaspoon every two hours until symptoms are gone, and boom, it wipes it out. Very, very strong, very, very powerful. We use it for Lyme disease, we use it for H. pylori, C. difficile, uh, just all kinds of health issues that, that are very powerful. Garlic. Allison is the component in garlic that builds the immune system. It's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antiparasitic, antimicrobial, very, very powerful. And one more thing I'd like to share with you is, we're, you know, we were talking about cancer. I have a friend, he's a physician down in North Carolina, and he is having very good success. Again, where do you get this? In your kitchen medicine cabinet not your bathroom medicine cabinet or you, got it, you didn't get it from the pharmacy. But it's lavender oil. Remember my little grandson, Kyler, uses, his mama uses this to put him to sleep at night just in the diffuser? Well, that doctor, if he has a patient come in, comes in with breast cancer, he will put a half a teaspoon on, on the breast and on the other breast. And he does that four times a day. A half a teaspoon applied to each all over the full breast twice, uh, each breast, four times a day, and he is finding consistently within two months that cancer's gone. Phenomenal what God gave us is natural medicine.
that's in the kitchen medicine cabinet. A potato poultice. Now my grandmother taught me this years and years ago back on the mountain in Tennessee. And she would use a, a potato poultice. Let me get, I'll put it on this. Or as we called it back then, tater poultices. And you take and you just grade your potato. Be careful not to cut yourself. Potato poultices are very, very good. I had a guy come in to me one day. He was a Filipino fella. He was a maintenance man. And he was working on a, a heating unit where he worked. And he turned the valve to turn the propane off. And um, it was a dark room that he was in. And he couldn't find how to turn the light on, so he just pulled out his big lighter and flicked it on to read something on the furnace, and the valve was malfunctioning. And it did not turn off. When he turned it off, it did not turn the ball valve off. It exploded. It burnt him from here up. Hair was gone, eyebrows. I mean, and he was, his face, neck and face were totally burnt. And then he had stripes running up his face, kind of like those cars back in the 1950s that had flames painted on the sides of them. Well, that's what his face looked like, actually flame stripes coming up his face. So we came in and we laid him down on the, uh, on the table there in the exam room and we took aloe vera. This right here, aloe vera juice. I took a quart of it and slowly just kept pouring it on his face. It sucked it up like a dry sponge. A quart of aloe vera, it just soaked it right up into his face. And then we went and we got a potato and we grated it just like this and we put it on his face. And then we poured more aloe vera. And the only thing you could see in the man's face, we put a slice of aloe vera over his eyes and, and then we made two little holes right at his nose so he could breathe. But his rest is of his ears, neck, everything was covered in the potato poultice. And we'd leave it on for five minutes. Take it off because it was soaking up so much heat. We'd take it off, then we'd get more aloe vera and pour it on his face. Then we'd get more potato poultice. The kitchen, our dietary department, could not keep up with making the potatoes fast enough, grading it with the potato grater. So they started blending it in the Cousinart, in the food processor. Well, we ran out of aloe vera. That's how I learned to make this here tonight. Um, what he did is, is we, we had, in the greenhouse, we had a bunch of aloe vera plants. And we had staff that were from Venezuela and Colombia. And, and I sent them down to go make fresh aloe vera, just like this here, like we made here today. And we kept using it. And we eventually went to every 15 minutes. And then we went to every half hour, depending on how hot the potatoes were getting. The man didn't have a scar. We treated him for five hours, taught his wife what to do. He went home. She continued. He didn't have one. He healed right up and didn't have one scar on him. One of the physicians that was with us that day said, if I, he's a surgeon, he said that if I had t treated him in the emergency department with what I have to use in the emergency department, that man would have been scarred for life. Now God did the healing. But God used and blessed grated potatoes and aloe vera what comes out of the kitchen medicine cabinet. But you can put it on bee stings. Um, there's just all kinds of things you can use potato poultices for. But it works very, very well. And so what you can do is, let's say if you've got a bee sting, you can put it on there. Put that potato poultice on there. Put you some of that cellophane on there or garbage bag or something and, hold, and tape it on there. 
and then change it about every 30 minutes and uh, it'll pull that sting out from that, that bee sting or wasp sting. Another favorite poultice of mine is a cabbage poultice. And cabbage poultices work very well. Now don't make the mistake that I did one time. We ran out of green cabbages. And I had a man that flew over from London because he was having problems with hemorrhoids. And so they were so bad that they couldn't, they couldn't fix them there. And so he came over for us to help him with his hemorrhoids. And one night, about nine o'clock, I was making a, a cabbage poultice for him to put another one to put on his, his, um, his hemorrhoid. And I didn't have any green cabbage, but I had red cabbage. So I went and made him a, a cabbage poultice out of red cabbage. That man stained his, his, his night clothes, the carpet, the bedding, everything. Don't use red cabbage. So what you do is you take it and you can take a hammer or something and you beat it to where it bleeds. A hammer works real well or a, or a rock. But what you're doing is you're, is you're beating it to where the juice comes out of it. You're making the juice, you're through frac, you are fracturing the cells and the juice now is on there. So it's the cabbage juice, but you don't want to do it in a Cousinart. You want to do it just like what we're doing right here. So let's say you have a, um, a hemorrhoid You'll take, you'll place this up on the hemorrhoid and take like a sanitary napkin or something that will hold it in place and then put your underwear on and, and that will help to uh, uh, shrink the, the uh, external hemorrhoid. Not the internal, but the external hemorrhoid. We also use it, let's say if a person has a broken bone and there's a lot of pain, you can apply it right onto the broken bone and you know, put several cabbage poultices around there or let's say it's a fractured ankle, put it on there and put some cellophane on there or wrap it with some uh, Curlex, some gauze, or, and, and it will help to help with the pain. Um, we also use it for wounds. If we, I like, you, you saw the, the wound formula that I made in the charcoal poultice, but let's say you don't have that and you're somewhere that's a bad wound that you need to go help somebody with, take a cabbage poultice, chop it up like that, make sure it's bleeding real well, apply that onto the wound, Put something on top of it. It's good to put the cellophane because it holds the moisture in instead of evaporating out. It works very well also for wounds. Immune drinks, there's different kinds out there. We made the rocket fuel. That's an immune drink. Well, this is a different type of immune drink, another one that God gives us so many different tools to use. This one uses a grapefruit. Isn't it neat where we can just use our food to be our medicine? So we're going to use a grapefruit. We're going to use an orange What's orange is good for? A lot of vitamin C. Now a lot of folks will say, well I can drink me some orange juice and I'll get that vitamin C. Well, several reasons you don't want to drink that orange juice. If you didn't make it, it was made a couple weeks ago or a month ago, wherever they made that orange juice, that, orange, that vitamin C is probably oxidized and gone. The other is, is it takes a lot more than just one orange to make a glass of orange juice. And oranges, fruit, are very high in fructose. And so even though when we were kids, or even to just, oh, probably 13 years ago, I would have said you need to drink 
you know, a quart of orange juice a day, but we don't do that anymore because it will lower the immune system. Let's say that you've got a, a urinary tract infection, and so what do you use? Cranberry juice. Well, you're after the D-mannose is the chemical that's in the cranberry juice, but the problem is that cranberry juice is full of sugar. And here you have an infection. So what are you doing? You're actually lowering your immune system. So you don't want to use the cranberry juice for urinary tract infection. You want to get the D-mannose, which is an extract, just like the allicin is an extract from the garlic, or um, bromelain is an extract from pineapple that we use if a person has inflammation or if they're looking for a uh, digestive enzyme. And so your, um, your D-mannose is gonna, it'll wipe out a urinary tract infection. Just one teaspoon of D-mannose every two hours during the symptoms of urinary tract infection, gone, wipes it out. And you don't want that cranberry juice because it has so much sugar in it. So we got one grapefruit, one orange. We've got two lemons. And I'm leaving the pulp on as much as I can because that pulp inside is good for you for this. Doing it a little faster than normal. The lemons are really good. It's good for your pH, good for your immune system. It's a great anti-inflammatory. When you get up every morning, cardiologists tell us that we should drink water first thing in the morning, and one of the last things we do at night, drink a little bit of water. Be careful, though, if you're having problems with your prostate or it's going to keep you up all night. You, don't, you want to get that sleep. But when you drink water, it thins out the platelets, and you're less prone for a heart attack or a stroke. Well, the lemon water, first thing in the morning, drink you some warm lemon water. That liter, that two cups of water, is going to free flow, and it's going to clean your urinary tract. The warm water is going to stimulate peristalsis, make your bowels get running good, work right. And then the lemon is, again, it's going to help your pH to come up to make you more alkaline instead of acidic. It's anti-inflammatory. It's going to be good for, it's a good blood purifier. And it's also going to help your immune system. So lemons are, lemon water is great to drink first thing each morning. So we've got a grapefruit, an orange, two lemons. Let's get two cloves of garlic. Let's see, three cloves of garlic. So I'm going to put three cloves of garlic in there. And then we're going to put three drops of the peppermint essential oil. Just three drops, that's all. Not like the uh, smoker's blend. One, two, three. That's it. I think we got an extra, but we'll be okay. And then what you're going to do, is blend it. Just a little water. May have to put a little more in a moment. But we'll start with that. going to drink this whole thing like you did the rocket fuel. For an adult, you're going to drink one cup a day, and for a child, you're going to drink a half a cup a day, and you'll just go and take it, and you're going to put it in the freezer or refrigerator. The next one is an onion poultice. You notice we're using onions a fair amount and garlic, 
It's because it's just super good if we're sick to use a, uh, an onion. And so you're, you're taking it and you're peeling it like this. Then you're going to chop it up. Well, we've already chopped it up. And what you want to do is you want to simmer it. And you'll simmer it with water. And we did this ahead of time to save us a little time. And then we're going to take um, some, some, um, some ginger. Put some ginger in here. Just a little bit of ginger. Mix it up thoroughly. You don't want it real hot, but you don't want it cold. Now, if you have a piece of um, a material, you can use a piece of material, a piece of uh, a cloth. Or if you don't have that, I prefer the cloth, but if you don't have it, you can use a, uh, a paper towel. And tape it. Now if you use a paper towel, as you can see it's getting, it's going to get wet through there. And so it's working well. And then you'll just apply it to the affected area. And you, you can turn it under, tape it, whatever. And then apply it on the, a lot of times we use an onion poultice for lung issues. Uh, if a person's having respiratory problems, we'll just apply that, lung po that onion poultice right on where the lungs are. Again, something that we have in the kitchen medicine cabinet. Okay, so let's look at what we can do here. Let's first start with a T. I like T's a lot. And what we're going to do is we're going to take and make some wild lettuce tea. Wild lettuce tea is excellent for helping people calm down, but the biggest thing that I've used wild lettuce for over the years is for pain. We'll come back to that, but let's get it started. And I'll show you how to make a tea. Well, let's check our tea over here. It's working real, it looks real good. All you need, just stir it. Now some people use tea balls, but I use quite a bit of herb when I'm using things medicinally. Some herbs you can use more. Most herbs you can use more than you, a lot of times you'll use a teaspoon to put in a teacup. That's just enjoying drinking. But if you're doing a medicinal, you've got to use more. But there's two herbs that I don't use more because they don't work right if you use more. And uh, one is um, uh, sage and the other one's catnip. So if you have a little child that's, I had a lady bring her daughter in just the other day and the baby was crying and it had colic or it may have croup, uh, this one had colic. And um, you just take a teaspoon to a cup of water, make a tea and then you'll give that little baby a teaspoon or two teaspoons every couple hours or older child a little bit more. But I ask the moms, I'll ask them, are you breastfeeding your baby? They're not. And it's amazing what God has done to help your babies from getting sick. We've now learned that, that well we've known for years that breast milk will help with the bone structure We've known for years that it helps with the immune system. We've known for the last probably 10 years that it's, it's very important for the gastrointestinal system. But it's just the last couple years we found cardiovascular wise, especially I'm now reading from the year one and two. That means you need to nurse that baby to the baby's two years old to get that full cardiac benefit. And these moms will come in and they'll say, no, I don't, I don't nurse my baby, it's gross. Gross. No, that's the way God made it. And these children that come in and the moms are bringing them in, they got colic and they got croup and they're just sick, their bellies are hurting. If they just nurse that child, then that many times uh, that will take, uh, that would have prevented that. And so I asked the moms, 
would you like to start breastfeeding? And if they are interested, I have my wife work with them. Because even ladies who um, adopt, we're able to get those ladies to breastfeed. That's fun. That is so cool because just the bonding between the mom and, and the infant or the immune system and, and all those benefits I just mentioned for the baby. And so I encourage you to encourage other folks to be sure and breastfeed. Remember I told you that in 1969, my home state was the fourth healthiest state. And in 2009, it was the fourth unhealthiest state. The fifth item that Nashville found, the Department of Health, women don't breastfeed in my state anymore. And that was a major cause that in 19, oh, uh, 2009, people were less healthy because babies were not being breastfeed. In the top five, that was a major reason. What do you use to help that mama have uh, breast milk? You can use fenugreek. You can use feverfew, uh, marshmallow root. But um, fenugreek is the big one that we use, and it works very well. So I encourage you. So all we do is, is like I said, we, we, I don't usually use the, those little herb balls. And so I'll just put it in there and I'll pour this through a kitchen strainer and put it into a mason jar. And they can either, well, for the wild lettuce, they'll drink one cup every two hours. If that works and the pain's gone, then try every three hours. And if that works, every four hours. What we called least dosing when I worked in regular health care. If you had pain, we'd hit you hard with an arc and then you, a narcotic, and then we calm down that pain, and then uh, we would figure out, uh, let's say we'd, we'd go and look, figure least dosing, we'd cut back, cut back until you had pain again, and come back up until we managed that pain. We did the same thing with psychotropics, come down, just saw that behavior again, come back up until we managed that behavior, and that was least dosing. Do the same thing with this. There's no sense in taking more than what you need, but take enough that will, that will work. So we'd start out with a fourth of a cup or a half a cup of the wild lettuce and a quart of water, Make the tea, strain it, drink one cup every two hours, that should do it. If, it. if it works well, again, every three hours, four hours, you may find that two cups a day does well to address your pain. Folks with arthritis will use it uh, just for all kinds of pain. My oldest son had some dental work done one time, and the dentist told him he was going to have to have something for pain. And my son said, no, I'm okay, I'll, I'll be okay. And the dentist did the work. And he said, what did you take before you came here? My son said, what do you mean? He said, there's no way that you didn't have that pain if what I did. He said, what did you take? Thinking he took a narcotic. My son said, I just drank some wild lettuce before I came. I drank a quart of wild lettuce this morning. He said, what? He said, I just drank a quart of wild lettuce before I came and had this dental work done. And he didn't, he, he felt it a little bit, but he didn't have the pain. And the dentist knew that something he'd been taking. Calcium smoothie. In the calcium smoothie, we're going to use a fourth of a bunch of parsley. Now, parsley is really good. If you, I'll, t I'll tell you two of them. I had a good friend. He was a surgeon, um, and he called it his, uh, his blood, infu uh, dr blood transfusion. And he'd put the whole thing in there and then put a little bit of, of um, pineapple juice, like we're going to do in a minute, and blend it up and have our patients drink it. It is full of nutrients. This is a great blood cleanser. It's great in chlorophyll. But for this one, we're just going to use, for the calcium smoothie, we're just going to use a fourth of it. Also, another great source of calcium that we mentioned earlier is this guy right here, uh, stinging nettle. Nettle tea has the most calcium of any of the herbs that I'm aware of. So then we're going to add a cup of pineapple juice. See where I put it, here we are. Let me use this right here. Just not quite a cup, so we'll put a little bit more.
And you want to blend it till it's very smooth. And you're going to drink one to two cups a day if you're needing some extra calcium. Now, calcium, I'm not that much into supplementation, calcium supplementation. I'd rather get my calcium from these guys right here, green leafy vegetables, your spinach, your kale. If you do take calcium, though, in a capsule, in a supplement, make sure that you do a two to one ratio, calcium to magnesium, because when you take calcium, it's going to use up magnesium that's in your body and that's going to make you deficient in magnesium. We'll talk about magnesium later, but you want, say you're taking a thousand milligrams of, of calcium, you need 500 milligrams of magnesium. But here's what's cool. God put the right ratio in your greens. God's going to take care of us. The other one's a colon formula. And this colon formula uh, really made a difference in my life. As I mentioned earlier, um, I had a physician a number of years ago actually tell me that I was going to die because I had some significant colon issues. And um, so I went to a different doctor and he said, I think I can help you. And one of the things he had me do was this colon formula. So let me share it with you. And we help a lot of folks with this colon formula. We're going to use psyllium seed husk, the whole. Don't use the powder. Uh, trust me, it'll get like jello. So you're going to do psyllium seed husk whole. And um, to help us here on time, what we'll do, so we're going to do two parts. We'll say it's one. Two, two parts psyllium, one part slippery elm powder. Slippery elm is phenomenal from anything from the mouth to the rectum. Very, very good for the digestive tract. One part psyllium powder, a half a part marshmallow root, and a fourth a part a peppermint and a fourth of a part, a spearmint. It's that, that's it. So mix it well. And you want two tablespoons, two to three times a day. I used it in water. Some people will use apple juice. I don't prefer the apple juice if they have ulcerative colitis or any type of, of uh, or, uh, or a uh, ulcerative proctitis because that you don't want anything raw, fruits or vegetables, for six months until that's healed up. So I like, and so you just take the uh, two tablespoons twice, stir it in there, but drink it pretty fast. But the, uh, the, the slippery elm, the marshmallow root, the peppermint, the spearmint are really, really good to help heal uh, those, the tissue of those ulcers or even IBS. We use it a lot for IBS. Then there's an ulcer formula that we use. In the ulcer formula, sim very similar, we're going to put one part slippery elm. So you've got a stomach ulcer. One part slippery elm. A half a part licorice root. And I did licorice root also. Licorice is really good if you're having problems with the colon. And then one part marshmallow root. And then uh, you're going to want uh, one part comfrey. And this is comfrey root. And then one part golden seal. Golden seal is a favorite of mine. But be cautious on golden seal. Golden seal is very powerful. And you want to, want to use golden seal for about two weeks. And then you want to stop it for about a, at least a week, if not two weeks. And, and alternate with something else. But also don't take it long term. Long term golden seal utilization can cause depression. And so you want to be careful. And so what you do is just stir it up. And you can just take it and, you know, take a tablespoon uh, twice a day of it. It'll be fine. Would you like a bonus? I'll tell you how to get strep throat, how to get rid of strep throat in less than 24 hours normally. What you do is you take a teaspoon 
of golden seal. You put it in a cup of water, make a tea. And what you're gonna do is you're going to, every two hours, take enough to gargle for two minutes and then swallow it. Every two hours of waking hours, and normally within 24 hours, strep throat is gone. Phenomenally powerful. This will clean your colon out. We're gonna make a colon detox. You're gonna take two parts charcoal. Uh, you want uh, three parts bentonite clay. You want seven parts psyllium powder. Not whole, powder one, powder one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If it's too much, if it gets too sticky like, like, um, um, Jello, go to the hole, at least to get it down. It, it'll still work okay, but the powder seems to work a little bit better. And then we're going to use one part fennel. I'm mix it well. Now, if you have diverticulitis or diverticulosis, you don't want to use this. But if you don't have it, or if you do have it, you don't want to use flaxseed. But if you don't have diverticulitis or diverticulosis, diverticulosis, you can add some flaxseed in here. And the reason I don't put it in this formula is because I don't want to take a chance in somebody who has that, uh, the diverticulitis or losis, uh, diverticulosis to to bother them. But flaxseed, when you leave it whole and don't grind it, you know how you use it for egg replacer and you let it get real slimy when you soak it in water? That slimy stuff is really good to heal your colon walls. And so it's also a good mucilage to help uh, take stuff out. And so you add it up and you can take like a tablespoon or two tablespoons uh, several times a day, either in water or in apple juice. The next item that I use a lot, and when I first started using it, um, the physician I was working with, he would have every single patient that came in to see us uh, use this. And it's a colon, uh, actually a liver gallbladder cleanse, but you're also going to colon cleanse also. And we did every single patient. It didn't matter if they were coming in with cancer, heart disease, diabetes, whatever it was. We did this on every single patient. And so I would draw labs on them to make sure their electrolytes weren't going off. And uh, I did it for three months on every single patient, drew those labs every other day during this process, and not once did we have any out negative outcomes out of that. It's very important that when we change and make lifestyle changes that we do a, a cleanse, a detox. Juicing is a great way to detox. Just eating fruits and vegetables somewhat detoxes us, but not as much as a vegetable juicing does for you know three, seven days, something like that. But to really get the gallbladder and the liver, do a good detox there, you want to do this uh, process I'm getting ready to share with you. I had a man come into me one time, and he'd just come back from over in Europe, and he was speaking in Europe, and when he got to Heathrow in London, uh, he, at the airport there, he had a significant gallbladder attack and they sent it, rushed him to the hospital and they said, sir, you're going to have to have your gallbladder out. And uh, they stabilized him and for some reason they shipped him back to America to have that done. And he went to the big medical center near us and they said, sir, your gallbladder is, is totally full of gallstones. You're going to immediately have to get it out. And he says, I want a second opinion. So he came up to me and he said, Walt, he says, can you help me? Can we get rid of these gallstones? I, I don't want to lose my gallbladder. I said, I think we can. 
So we did this, what I'm getting ready to share with you, and he went back to this major medical center, not one gallstone left in his gallbladder, and he kept his gallbladder. So uh, it works very well. And the other, so it's great for cleaning the gallbladder if you have uh, 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 gallbladder issues there, not working well, or gallstones. Person says they have fatty liver, they have problems with um, um, liver, not, you know, they've taken drugs, medications, or whatever for many years, and they want to clean all that out. It works well. Uh, my wife did this, and uh, this terrible, terrible, nasty stuff came out. And, and I, we had two physicians there, and, and we, they came in, and we looked at it, and they'd never seen this before. And what they figured it was is when she was 15 years old, she had acute myelocytic leukemia, and they treated her for a year and a half with chemotherapy. A year and a half with chemotherapy. And um, it, it, God healed her. But they figured it was the residual from that chemotherapy that the liver uh, got rid of during this cleanse that I'm getting ready to share with y'all. And uh, it, it's very effective. So what you do is for, if the person has a gallbladder, if they have a gallbladder, if they don't, they don't have to do this part. But for three days, you want to drink a quart of, of uh, apple juice. You know the apple juice, you know the dark in color apple juice, not that stuff you can see through at the grocery store but something like you buy in October, that stuff. And you want to drink a quart of that throughout each day for three days. And what it does is the pectin in the apples soften the gallstones. And it's like an insurance policy. If they do have gallstones and we don't want them to get stuck in the bile duct as, it's, as we're doing this cleanse, that pectin in the apple juice will soften them so it's not as rigid and it can go through. Then what you do is day one, two, three, you'll do the, uh, the apple juice. And then that night, what you'll do is about five o'clock in the evening is you're going to take and you're going to get three ounces of fresh, it needs to be fresh, lemon juice. So we can use this here. This is better. All right. Three ounces of lemon juice. Three ounces of olive oil. Now for y'all that are in, let's say that you live down in Venezuela, or you live down in uh, Brazil, or in some company, country that doesn't have olive oil, then what you can do is you can use two ounces of coconut oil. Two ounces of coconut oil instead of the uh, the uh, olive oil, because I know in some places, even down in Jamaica, they have sometimes have problems getting the, uh, the olive oil. So you can use the coconut oil instead. Take that, and you get about a thumb worth of ginger, and you're going to grate it up uh, and put it in there. If you have a blender, it's a whole lot better. You're going to just drop this in there, blend it up real good, but if you don't have a blender, you just grade this up really good or get uh, ginger powder, a tablespoon of ginger powder, and put it in there, stir it up, and you're going to drink that. Uh, but before you drink that, you're going to take 30 drops of lobelia because the lobelia is going to dilate your, uh, your, uh, your bile duct. Now, that's if you have a, ga a gallbladder. Uh, if you don't have a gallbladder, you don't have to worry about this part, just like you don't have to worry about uh, doing the apple juice. But you're going to take 30 drops of this. Then you're going to drink this here. And again, if you have a gallbladder, you'll lay down on your right side with a heating pad or a hot water bottle underneath your gallbladder, right here, for one hour. Get up, do whatever you need to do, and go on to bed. Now, I say around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock at the latest. We used to do it, when we first started doing it, we'd do it about 9 o'clock at night. Patients would go to bed right after, or we'd do it at 8.45, and they'd go on to bed, uh, and they'd lay down and spend their hour that way while they'd gone, gone on the bed. But if a person is, is, eats a healthy diet, now, most of the people I work with down in northeast Tennessee, they eat a lot of oil. They fry everything, from their okra to their potatoes to their tomatoes. We fry everything down there. 
And so when they drink this, this oil does not bother them at all. But if, if you don't have a high oil intake diet, it may make you a little nauseous about two or three hours later. And I don't want to wake you up around midnight. So what you do is take it around five o'clock. And then if you, get, if you do get a little nauseous, take a little peppermint tea and that'll settle you right down. Now what that's going to do tonight is it's going to back flush your liver and your gallbladder. Now you're not done because it's going to put it into the colon. The next morning, the next morning, you want to take a half a gallon of warm water body temperature. And then you're going to take five teaspoons. And that's going to make it right at isotonic. Five teaspoons of sea salt. There we go. Stir it up good. This is the first thing the next morning. You're also going to put the juice of two lemons in there. Hang on a sec. It's right about two lemons worth. Now, the volume of water is to flush you. You want to flush that out of your colon. Have you ever flushed a toilet with a bucket of water? Well, you, you take a big bucket of water and flush that toilet. You don't take a teaspoon or a tablespoon and put in there and try to flush that toilet. It takes volume of water to flush that toilet. Well, to flush that colon, it's going to take about a half a gallon of water, drinking it in 30 minutes. Don't go over or it's not going to work. 30 minutes. And I tell folks, just pour it into a mason jar, fill up two mason jars. In 15 minutes, you've got to have one finished. In the other 15 minutes, you've got to have the other one finished. And don't try to just guzzle it down. It might come up the other way if you drink it too fast. So just drink it one quart, 15 minutes. The other quart, 15 minutes. The volume of water is going to flush the, col uh, the, the colon. The salt is going to stimulate the colon to move. The warm water is going to stimulate the colon to move. The lemon, that's just for taste. Now, you're not finished. That bathroom is yours for two and a half hours. And, and stay there. Don't think you can even go to the kitchen to do something because you may not make it back. But it's going to flush your colon. So you're actually getting a liver cleanse, a gallbladder cleanse, and a colon cleanse all at once. And you're going to do this for five nights. The lemon, the olive oil, the ginger. Next morning, the salt water. The next night, same thing. So you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna back flush, cleanse. Back flush, cleanse the colon. Back flush, cleanse the colon for five nights. It's extremely effective and great to, to help that liver Help that gallbladder, and you know you're got. Sometimes people will come into me and they'll say, "Well, I don't want to take the go lightly to have a colonoscopy. What can I do?" Well, I just have them do this. They'll do this one morning. The, they'll do if they want to. I tell them to do it for two mornings. Make sure you're good and clean. But normally, just uh, the night and the morning before, they go to get that colonoscopy. The colonos the uh, gastroenterologist has no idea. It's just slick as a whistle down through there and it will clean you right out. An eye wash. There's times people get things in their eyes and if you've cut your eye, if you've got something in your eye and it scratched it, the best thing is vitamin E oil. Works very, very well. But let's say you want to flush that. Then what you can do is you can make a, uh, a tea and that tea is going to have, it's going to be one part eye bright Eye bright's really good for your eyes. One part eye bright. One part chamomile. Remember we use chamomile for helping us sleep at night. 
one part, uh, half a part fennel. Let's do, we can do the whole, that's fine. We can do the whole, we can do powder. Half a part fennel, one part bilberry, and now let's go back to my favorite. One of my favorites, golden seal. One fourth, one fourth part golden seal. You're going to mix it well, and you're going to make a tea. Now, notice here, I've got some parts in here that you don't want to stick in your eyes. So, I like using a coffee filter. Now, you can use a paper towel, several thick, but sometimes it, it may tear a little. And so, I like using a coffee filter. Now, I don't drink coffee, but that coffee filter is an excellent filter when I'm doing an eye bright tea or a golden seal tea or this tea here that I'm going to put in a person's eye because I want to make sure it's just only uh, going to be that tea. I don't want anything in there to scratch the eye. You just make a tea and then uh, what you'll do is you strain it well and then you'll put it into the eye and it's a great eye wash. Then there's an eye tea. This one has uh, eye bright leaves. And again we're going to do one part. So here we can use this one right here. Why don't we use this one? I'm going to do one part upright. And we're going to do one part bilberries. Just different herbs. You'll see a lot of similarity. And then you're going to um, mix it up. One teaspoon per cup of water. Make a tea. Strain it. And again, strain it very well before you put it into your eyes. Eye strengthening formula. We're going to use ginkgo biloba. We're going to do... Uh, you can either do capsules, as it mentions on the screen. Uh, you can make, take three capsules three times a day. Bilberry, 100 milligrams, three times a day. And then milk thistle, 100 milligrams, three times a day. Or you can just make a tea of it, where you're doing the uh, ginkgo, uh, the uh, bilberry, and the milk thistle. The same way, I do it uh, equal parts, and then make a tea of it and drink it. So you can either make the tea, or you can do it in capsules. Let me share with you a bonus before we leave. I have a good friend who is a missionary over in China. And he tells me, he's a medical missionary, and he tells me that, that when they treat patients, or if, or if you go to visit a Chinese home, they're going to take, and right before you, when you go to bed, they'll have you get in your bed clothes and sit on the side of the bed. And then they're going to go to their kitchen, and they're going to get a little pail of warm water, about neutral in temperature, about 102 degrees. 103 degrees, and, and if there's Epsom salt, you can put some Epsom salt in there. That really helps. About, say, a cup of Epsom salt, half a cup, cup of Epsom salt in there. And then they're going to bring it to your room, and they're going to have you put your feet in it. They'll set it there. You know how the Chinese are. They'll sit there and set it down, and they'll put your, they don't tell you put your feet in there. They'll take your feet and set your feet down in there very politely. And uh, you can actually even put a, a blanket across your feet, and then they'll leave for maybe about 20 minutes. What's happening physiologically there is you've got vasodilation with that warm water. It's not really hot, but it's nice and warm. It calms the nerves. And as it dilates the vessels, the congestion that's in the head and the rest of the body, that blood is going to come and go towards that lower area. Just like we do when we do a, uh, let's say if a person has a migraine headache, we're going to put their feet in, in hot water and then we're going to put an ice pack to the back of the neck, an ice pack to the forehead, and it's going to force that blood out of the brain down to the feet. Well, this, they're just not wanting to excite you that much, and so they're not putting the ice here and here, so they're just putting that warm water in, uh, with your feet in it, and it's calming your nerves, and also it's pulling the blood away from congested areas. If you use magnesium, or the Epsom salt, which is magnesium, Magnesium helps to calm nerves also. Excellent for helping people to fall asleep. And it transdermally will go into your feet. Your feet are a great source to absorb things. We talked about 
uh, essential oils, great place to put them. Garlic, you can actually take garlic and crush it. Crush it, put it in a sock and put it in your feet. In about 20 minutes, you're gonna taste that garlic because it's soaking up through there and getting into you. So putting your feet in that warm water before you go, great way guys to treat your wife or wives, good way to treat your husbands. And set that down, their feet down in there and, and it's gonna calm them down and then they come back in after about 20 minutes. They'll bring a towel and they'll dry your feet really nice. And then they'll take that back to the kitchen and dump it. And you're ready to go to bed. Well, y'all, thanks for coming and visit. We'll see y'all next time.